Multi-store model of human memory, originally proposed in 1964 by Atkinson and Schifrin. Their original model comprised just two stores and a couple of basic processes. And what they wanted to demonstrate was that there was a, a dichotomous or absolute difference between two types of memory that human beings have. So the first type of memory would have been the memory for things that we're doing right now. So like a, a storage space for things like telephone numbers. You, know, you, you look them up, you rehearse them to yourself, you use them, you drop them, forget them. And they contrasted that with long-term storage, which was the, the memory that we have for events in our lives, procedures, skills, things like that. Of course, as time has gone on, the model has become more complex. So it now comprises at least three stores and at least four processes. For the purposes of the A-level specification, it's probably sufficient. So we start out with sensations, uh, fed through our numerous uh, physical senses, so not only the five basic senses we think of, but all of them, so things like our sense of movement and balance and our sense of heat and pain, and all the other senses that we have that are not as easy to recognise because they don't have obvious sense organs to go with them. These feed into what, what is now known as sense memory. This was the store that wasn't originally proposed in the model, but has since been adopted and inserted in most accounts of multi-store models, so we're going to include it. It's got a large capacity. It handles all the sensory input from our sensory systems, so all of our vision, all of our hearing, taste, touch, sight, and so on and so on. It obviously, because it has a large capacity, must also have a brief duration, otherwise we'd be overwhelmed with the information that we get from our senses. It must be multimodal, or not specifically encoded. Multimodal because it brings us information in visual format in our iconic storage, in uh, echoic uh, sense memory we have acoustic data, and so on and so forth. There are a number of different sense memory stores, subsystems if you like. That passes through the attentional system, or through the attentional process, into another store. So we've got an overwhelmingly large amount of information that only lasts mercifully for a very brief amount of time, and we select from it via the attentional process stuff that we pass into short-term memory. Now the short-term memory, clearly a small capacity store, relative to the amount of stuff that we had going on here in sense memory, short-term memory has got to be smaller in capacity because we've paid attention to some and dropped a hell of a lot else. So the small capacity is explained because the attention is essentially a filtering process. It's um, still relatively brief duration, although quite a bit longer than sense memory. Uh, short-term memory without rehearsal seems to last somewhere between 3 to 20 seconds and the amount of information you recall accurately falls off very rapidly in that period. So at, at around the three second mark we reckon we're probably good for about 90% of what we've got and after about 10 seconds it's down well below 50% and at the 18 second mark well we're less than 10% reliable. Atkinson and Schifrin argued that the short-term memory storage was largely or primarily acoustic. In fact they originally said it was exclusively acoustic. Uh, this flew in the face of evidence that had been hanging around for ages anyway, so it's a bit of a, an extreme statement to have made, but it's what they said, so that's the model. It also gives us a, a rather nice AO2 point to make here, you know, if we're criticising and evaluating, we can say, well, obviously, the model as it was originally proposed is excessively simplistic because it sees short-term memory as being entirely acoustic, which is not the case. Um, and it, it, what happens is that we go from sensations here in sense memory to perceptions here in short-term memory. Now, short-term memory is maintained by rote rehearsal according to Atkinson and Schifrin. So this rote rehearsal is the business of saying stuff back over and over to ourselves. We're very familiar with it. We do it when we're, we're trying to handle small snippets of information over that we know we're going to forget very quickly. So the telephone number is the obvious example there. Sufficient rote rehearsal of data or information in short-term memory will result in encoding. Now, here in short-term memory, it was all acoustically encoded. The encoding that takes place with sufficient rote rehearsal is, of course, the famous semantic encoding that they talk about, which passes stuff into long-term memory. Now, long-term memory is a relatively long duration, 
uh, high large capacity storage system that uses meaning or semantics. So we store here not sensations, not perceptions, but concepts, conceptions. And so encoding turns acoustic codes into meaning codes of concepts. So instead of us simply saying 313247 to ourselves as the telephone number, sufficient re rehearsal will turn that into the meaning of oh, that's Auntie Anne's number or something like that. Now, of course, once it's stored in long term memory, because short term memory is the space in which we handle um, stuff that we're working on at the moment, there has to be some mechanism to get us from long term memory back to short term memory again. And that process is called retrieval. And the retrieval process, separate from the encoding process, is th th these two processes that link short and long term memory. The idea that they are separate processes linking these two things is what's used to explain things like the clinical evidence that we have from cases like Clive Waring or HM, places of, of amnesia. So in the one instance we have, particularly in Clive Waring's case, we've got both in one go, but cases where the guy can't make new long-term memories. So he's got his memory of his previous experiences all intact. He had some kind of catastrophic traumatic event in his brain and that damaged presumably some part of his hippocampus and now he's no longer able to lay down new long-term memories and that's an encoding problem. He can rehearse and he can probably extend his short-term memory and may even have you know a massively extended short-term memory in comparison to the rest of us. He may have to but what you get is the inability to make the new memory of things like oh I've already told you this so I wind up telling you stuff over and over again sometimes you'll see that referred to as Korsakoff syndrome it's prevalent in some forms of advanced alcoholism on the other hand you also get retrieval problems and this is the other kind of amnesia this is the business of I can't can't drag the memory back from my past so at some point where they had the trauma, the brain damage, and now I've got the retrieval problem as well. So I can't actually reach in there and get stuff that I ought to know. So it's a very bare minimum. We all have this in the tip of the tongue experience. I know I know that thing, but I can't right now call it to mind. And of course, in a more amnesiac experience, it would be one of um, not being able to call it to mind ever. And so I know I can speak English, I speak English very well, but if I have the anterior, sorry, the retrograde amnesia, I can't recall learning it. I don't, I don't remember the point in my life when I acquired this language. Um, it may be that I know that my name is Ian, but I can't recall learning when that was the case. Now, most of us can't recall some specific features out of our early childhood, you know, like naming events and things like that but not being able to recall any of it, but still being able to use the information that we got then, that's the mark of the, the retrograde amnesiac. So we can see that the, the whole model is really rather useful. You know, this distinction between short-term and long-term memory, which is what started it all off, that holds water even today. So most theorists of memory would see the short-term, long-term distinction as a valid one. And they would point to examples from clinical evidence and research studies to support the, um, the insistence on that distinction, so it's an absolute break there. And the incorporation of sense memory, which came along later in the, the development of the model, we know that that goes back to research, there's you know, it's really some really very, very old research to support that, uh, from the, even as far back as the 1700s. And also there is common everyday experiences as well. So it's a well-supported model, it has, uh, it's, it's triggered a, a very large amount of continuing and ongoing research and of course has accommodated developments in theoretical thinking since, not least of which of course is the way in which Badley and Hitch's model of working memory can in some ways be thought of as simply an extension and expansion of this short-term memory store. And that's the whole story.